If you go to a dentist, if you hire a plumber, in all the professions, there is value added by the professionals as a group compared to doing it yourself or just randomly picking laymen. In the investment world, it isn't true. Well, I've said in the annual report that I've known maybe a dozen people in my life. Uh, and I said there are undoubtedly hundreds or maybe thousands out there, but I've said that I've known personally a dozen where uh, I would have predicted or did predict in, in a fair number of those 12 cases, I did predict that the person involved would do better than average in investing over a long period of time. And obviously, Charlie is one of those people. So would I pay him? Sure. But would I take financial advisors as a group and pay them 1% with the idea that they would deliver results to me that were better than the S&P 500 by 1% uh, and thereby leave me breaking even against what I could have done on my own? Uh, you know, there, there's very few. So it's, it's just not a good question to ask whether, you know, I pay Charlie 1%. That's like asking, you know, whether I'd have paid Babe Ruth, you know, 100000 or whatever it was to come over from the Red Sox to the Yankees. I mean, sure, I would have, but there weren't very many people I would have paid 100000 to in 1919 or whatever it was to come over to the Yankees. So uh, the it's a fascinating situation because the problem isn't that the advisors are going to do so terrible. It's just that you have a an option available that doesn't cost you anything that is going to do better than they are in aggregate. And uh, it it's an interesting question. I mean, if you if you hire an obstetrician, uh, assuming you need one, uh, they're going to do a better job of delivering the baby than you know if the spouse comes in to do it, or if they just pick somebody up off the street. And if you if you go to a dentist, if you hire a plumber, in all the professions, there is value added by the professionals as a group compared to doing it yourself or just randomly picking laymen. In the investment world, it isn't true. I mean, they, the active group, the people that are professionals in aggregate, are not, cannot do better than the people. The, aggregate of the people who sit, just sit tight. And if you say, well, in the active group, there's some person that's terrific, I, I will agree with you. But the passive people can't all pick that person and they wouldn't, they don't know how to identify them. So I, I, uh, it's yeah. even worse than that. The passive, <laughs> the expert who's really good when he gets more and more money in, he, he, he suffers just terrible performance problems. Yeah. And yeah. so you'll find the person who has a long career at two and 20, and if you analyze it, net all the people have lost money because some of the early people have had a good record, but more money come in later and they lose it. So it, it, the investing world is just, it's a morass of wrong incentives, crazy reporting, and uh, I'd say a fair amount of del delusion. Yeah, if you ask me whether I, those 12 people I picked would do better than the S&P working with $100 billion, I would answer that probably none of them would. I mean, that would not be their perspective performance. Uh, there's no, but when I was when I was talking of them, I, you know, or referencing them, and when they actually worked in practice, they dealt generally with pretty moderate sums. Uh, and... As the sums grew, uh, their relative advantage diminished. I mean, it's so obvious from history. The, the example I used in the report, I mean, the guy who made the bet with me, and incidentally, all kinds of people didn't make the bet with me because they knew better than to make the bet with me. Uh, well, they, there were hundreds, at least a couple hundred underlying hedge funds. These guys were incented to do well. The fund to fund manager was incented to pick the best ones they could pick. The guy who made the bet with me was incented to pick the best fund to funds. You know, and tons of money, and just in with those five funds, a, a lot of money went to pay 
managers for what was subnormal performance over a long period of time. And it, it can't be anything but that. And it's an interesting, you know, it's an interesting profession when you have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people who are compensated based on selling something that in aggregate can't be true, superior performance. So, uh, but it'll continue, and the best salespeople will tend to attract the most money, and because it's such a big game, people will make huge sums of money, you know, far beyond what they're going to make in medicine or you name it. I mean, you know, repairing the country's infrastructure. I, think, I mean, the big money, is huge money, is in selling people the idea that you can do something magical for them. And if you have, if you even have a billion dollar fund, you know, and, and get 2% of it for terrible performance, make, that's $20 million. In any other field, you know, it would just blow your mind. But people get so used to it, uh, you know, in the, in the field of investment that it just sort of passes along. And $10 billion, I mean, $200 million fees, We've got two guys in the office, you know, that are managing $11 billion. Uh, uh, well, no, they're not. I'm sorry. They're, 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 yeah, they're managing $20 billion, um, you know, between the two of them, $21 billion maybe. And uh, we, we pay them a million dollars a year plus the amount by which they beat the S&P. They have to actually do something to get uh, contingent compensation, which is much more reasonable than 20 percent. But how many hedge fund managers in the last 40 years have said, I only want to get paid if I do something for you, you know, you know, unless I actually deliver something beyond what you can get yourself, uh, you know, I don't want to get paid. It just doesn't happen. And, you know, it, get back, it's get back, it gets back to that line that I've used, but when I asked the guy, you know, how can you in good conscience, charge two and twenty, and he said, "Because I can't get three and 30. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Any more, Charlie? Or are we used up our? I think you've beaten up on them enough. <laughs> yeah. Well. Hi, Warren and Charlie. My name is Brian Martin, and I'm from Springfield, Illinois. In the HBO documentary "Becoming Warren Buffett," you had a great analogy comparing investing to hitting a baseball and knowing your sweet spot. Ted Williams knew his sweet spot was a pitch right down the middle. When both of you look at potential investments, what attributes make a company a pitch in your sweet spot that you'll take a swing at and invest in? Well, I, I'm not sure I can define it in exactly the terms you would like, but the, 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 we sort of know it when we see it, and it, it would tend to be a business that, for one reason or another, we can look out five or 10 or 20 years and decide that the competitive advantage that it, that it had at the present would last over that period. And it would have a trusted manager that would not only fit into the Berkshire culture, but that was eager to join the Berkshire culture. And then it would be a matter of price. But the main, you know, when we buy a business, essentially we're laying out a lot of money now based on what we think that business will de deliver over time. And the higher the certainty uh, with which we make that prediction, the better off, the better we feel about it. You can go back to the first, uh, wasn't, for, wasn't the first outstanding business we bought, but it was, it was kind of a, a watershed event, which was a relatively small company, Seize Candy. And the question when we looked at Seize Candy in 1972 was, would people still want to be both eating and giving away that candy in preference to other candies? Uh, and it wouldn't be a question of people buying candy for the low bid. And we had a manager we liked very much, and we bought a business that was paid $25 million for it net of cash, and it was earning about $4 million pre-tax then, and we must have, must be getting close to $2 billion or something like that pre-tax that we've taken out of it. But it was only because 
we felt that people would not be buying necessarily a lower price candy. I mean, it does not work very well if you go to your wife or your girlfriend on Valentine's Day, I hope they're the same person, uh, and, <laughs> and say, uh, you know, here's a box of candy, honey, I took the low bid. You know, it, it doesn't, it, it loses a little of it as you go through that speech. And we made a judgment about C's candy that it would be special and probably not, not in the year 2017, but we certainly thought it would be special in 1982 and 1992, and fortunately we were right on it. And we're looking for more C's candies, only a lot bigger. Charlie? Yeah, but it's also true that we were young and ignorant then. And <laughs> now we're old and ignorant. <laughs> yeah. and, yes, that's true too. And, and the truth of the matter is that it would have been very wise to buy C's candy at a slightly higher price and if they'd asked it, we wouldn't have done it. So we've gotten a lot of credit for being smarter than we were. Yeah, and to be more accurate, yeah. if it had been if it had been five million more, I wouldn't have bought it. Charlie would have been willing to buy it. So <laughs> yeah. fortunately, that we didn't get to the point where we had to make that decision that way. But he he would have pushed forward when I probably would have faded. It's a good thing. It's a good thing that the guy came around. Actually, the seller. Uh, was the uh, well, he's the grandson of, of Mrs. A, wasn't he, Charlie? He was Larry C's son, am I correct? Or Larry C's brother? But uh, he was not interested in the business, and he was he was he was interested in more interested in girls and grapes actually, and and he almost changed his mind. Well, he did change his mind about selling, and I wasn't there, but Rick Aaron t told me that. Charlie went in and gave a an hour talk on the merits of girls and grapes over having a candy company. <laughs> <laughs> this is true, folks. <laughs> and the fellow sold to us, so that I pulled Charlie out in emergencies like that. He's <laughs> we were very lucky that early the habit of buying horrible businesses because they were really cheap. It gave us a lot of experience trying to fix unfixable businesses as they headed downward toward doom. And that early experience was so horrible, fixing the unfixable, that we were very good at avoiding it thereafter. So I would argue that our early stupidity helped us. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, we learned we could not make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. No, so, we learned. So we learned. We went around looking for silk. But you have to try it for a long time and fail and have, you rub, have your nose rubbed in it to really understand it. <laughs> okay, Becky. Becky, quick. How much time is spent reviewing Berkshire stock holdings, and is it safe to assume if Berkshire continues to hold these stocks that the thesis remains intact? Well, we spend a lot of time thinking. Those are very large holdings. Uh, if you add up American Express, Coca-Cola, and Wells Fargo, I mean, you're getting up, uh, you know, well into the high tens of billions of dollars. And, and those are businesses we like uh, very much. They're, they're, they're different characteristics. In the case of, you mentioned United Airlines, we actually are the largest holder of all four of the large uh, we're, we're the largest holder of the four largest airlines, and that is much more of an industry thought. Uh, but all businesses uh, have problems, and, and some of them have some very big pluses. Uh, I personally, uh, you mentioned American Express. If you read American Express's first quarter report and talk about their platinum card, the platinum card is doing very well. Uh, the gains around the world, you know, I think there were 17 percent or something like that in buildings in the UK, and 15 percent is the original currency or the local currency. Japan, Mexico, and very good in the United States. Uh, uh, there, there's competition in all these businesses. If we thought we did not buy American Express or Wells Fargo or United Airlines, but Coca-Cola, with the idea that they would never have problems or never have competition, what we did buy. Why we did buy them is we thought they had very, very strong hands, and we liked the financial policies in the case of many of them. We 
we like. We, we like their position. We bought a lot of businesses, and we we do look to see where we think they have durable competitive advantage, and we recognize that if you've got a very good business, you're going to have plenty of competitors who are going to try and take it away from you, and then you make a judgment as to the ability of your particular company and product and management to ward off uh, competitors. They won't go away, but uh, uh, we think, I'm not going to get into the specific names on it, but those companies generally are very well positioned. I've, I've likened essentially, if you've got a wonderful business, even if it's a small one like C's Candy, you basically have an economic castle and in capitalism, people are going to try and take away that castle from you. So you want to moat around it, protecting it in various ways that can protect it. And then you want a knight in the castle that's pretty darn good at warding off marauders. But they're going to be marauders and they'll never go away. And uh, if you look at, uh, I think Coca-Cola was 1886, American Express was 18, I don't know, 51 or 52, uh, starting out with an express business. Uh, uh, Wells Fargo would, uh, I don't know what year they were started. Incidentally, uh, American Express was started by Wells and Fargo as well. Uh, so uh, these companies had lots of challenges, and they'll have more challenges than the companies we own have had challenges. Uh, our insurance business has had challenges, but, you know, we started with National Indemnity as $8 million purchase in 1968, and fortunately we've had people like Tony Nicely at Geico, and we've had, we've had G. Jane, who's added tens of billions of value, and we've got some smaller companies that you probably don't even know about, but really have done a terrific job for us. So there'll always be competition and in insurance, but but there'll always be there'll always be things to do that a really intelligent management with a decent distribution system, various things going for them, can do to to ward off the marauders. So I I. Uh, to the specific question, how much time is spent reviewing the holdings, I would say that I do it every day. I'm sure Charlie does it every day. Charlie? Well, I don't think I got anything to add to that either. Well, we'll cut his salary if he doesn't participate here. 